So I'm in the, um, in the nation of Cambodia, and uh, I got invited to go ahead and to teach a, uh, a seminar on leadership there. So as I'm talking to, I've got about 50 some odd students, I'm enjoying myself there talking to them. Uh, you have to speak through a translator, because I don't speak any Khmer, so that's a bit of an issue. So it's a little bit difficult when you're speaking through a translator whether they understand whether they're, you're connecting very well or not. And I was explaining to them, I said, you know, sometimes, sometimes as you are illustrating, sometimes when you're trying to get somebody's attention, sometimes you have to change things up a little bit. So, for example, if you speak at the same tone, after a while people say, well, that's the tone at which he speaks, and so therefore they, they become pretty accustomed to it. They begin to, to shut you down. They begin to not pay attention to you very much anymore. And so I said, so every once in a while, I said, you have to do something perhaps unexpected or something that will help people a little bit. And I remember that all of my students are sitting around the chairs, and I went and I walked over towards one of my students, and I decided to use my outside pastor voice right next to him. And this poor fellow, he probably weighed about 125 pounds, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and he began to quake a little bit because his back was slightly turned to me. And I saw him, I don't speak any Kamai either, but I saw him as he was motioning to the crowd. He went, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then the reality is, is this, is that, again, if you have one's particular tone, that after a while people begin to shut you down. And one of the most powerful things which you can do in your communication is actually to have silence. I thought about starting my message off this way. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'll start my message off and I'll just stand up here for five minutes and that will get your attention. I don't doubt that for a moment. That's probably not very good video. I understand that as well. So, so we won't do five minutes of, of silence like that way. But the reality is this, is that when there is that moment of silence, if you watch a TV commercial, every once in a while somebody's very bright and they go ahead and they just don't do any sound whatsoever. And eventually you're like, what's going on? And all of a sudden you see that, that they've they got, got your attention. That's what's going on here. Well, what we're going to see here today is what God has used this particular communication device, if you will. He's used silence. You see, 400 years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the prophet Malachi. Malachi has come, and Malachi has given his message. And his message is not a very easy message. It's not a very complimentary message. It is one which is mostly a rebuke to the people. And it's a rebuke because what has happened is though the people have come back from their captivity, and they've been back for quite some time, and though there has been a, a temple which is rebuilt, what has happened is that the people have begun to give that which is inferior to God. And they've given that which is crippled to God, that which is blind to God. And Malachi is there to rebuke the people saying, what are you doing? Haven't you learned enough that God is not impressed with the inferiority? God doesn't want the, your less. He wants your best. But that's it. And the Old Testament ends. And for 400 years now, we have this length of time where God has been essentially silent. I always have people that tell me, they say, well, God doesn't change his mechanism. He always does the same thing. That's not true. I mean, I look at this and God gives 400 years of silence. And here we are. So, as Americans, we are not very good at uh, lengths of time because we haven't been around as much as many people in this world. 400 years. Today is the 25th of November, 2023, correct? In no on November 21st, 1620, the pilgrims landed. Ah. Consider all of the history that has happened in the United States from a small group landing on Plymouth Rock to today. That is the amount of time that God has been silent for the nation of Israel. That's a long time. That's a long time. And we, we don't uh, 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 appropriately appreciate that silence. But here it is. The silence has come. And now, today... As we enter into the book of Luke, turn to Luke chapter 1. As we come to the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke has some introductory stuff, verses 1 through 4. We're going to leave that aside for today. We'll come back to that in the future. But we're going to pick it up in Luke chapter 1, and we'll pick it up in verse 5, and we're going to go through, oh, uh, we'll go through verse 25 this morning. But as we do so, what we'll see here is that the silence is broken. 
The silence is broken. So where beforehand God has said, you know what, I have spoken, now I'm going to be quiet, now God speaks. And when God speaks, he's going to speak to ordinary people, okay? He's going to speak in a way, quite frankly, to people that we probably wouldn't put high in our list as people who should be recipients of God's, of God's incredible message, but they are the ones that he picks. So we come to Luke, Luke chapter 1 and in verse 5, and we read this. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah and his wife, and he, excuse me, and he had a wife from the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So let's leave it there. We have here an introduction of Zechariah and Elizabeth. We are going to find out very soon here that these are going to be the parents of John the Baptist. And we have here, or we are told here that they are in the days, or this is all taking place in the days of Herod the Great. Now, Herod the Great, if you know anything about history, you know that Herod the Great is great because he's a great builder. Uh, he has made many improvements to the temple, for example, plus many, many other things. He is considered great because of that. But this is not a man. This is not a man who is friendly towards the Jews at large, and this is not a man who is friendly even to his own family. He is a bit of what we'd call a bit of a maniac. He will kill his many people in his own family. Uh, this is the man that we know from the book of Matthew. This is the man who will send the soldiers to massacre the innocents in Bethlehem. We know this. Okay? So this is the same Herods. We know that this man lives until about 4 BC, which gives us an indication about the time of the birth of John the Baptist, then eventually Jesus Christ himself. So in those days, what we have then is we have this couple, this couple Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're born during this time under the secular government of Herod the Great, a man of, a man who's a, a maniac, and I think that's a good way to put it. We look at them and we see that Zechariah, he's of the division of Abijah. He's one of the priests. His wife, her name is Elizabeth. She is a direct descendant of Aaron. This is considered a blessing. But here we have a problem as we continue on. They're called righteous and blameless. That's a good thing. Oh, let's talk about that first of all. Righteous and blameless. Let's talk about that. Does this mean that these are perfect individuals? No. These are not perfect individuals. When Luke is talking about them being righteous, he is not talking about the Pauline theology that they believed in God and they were justified or declared righteous, but he's talking about them to being good people. These are people you would have over for dinner, okay? These are nice people. They're not perfect people. Matter of fact, if you want to make them perfect people, go to verse 20, and we see that Zechariah is rebuked for his lack of belief. So if you want to make them perfect, Zechariah only makes it to verse 20. Okay? All right, I'm sorry, sorry. Okay, it's easy enough. But I don't think that Luke is trying to say that they're perfect anyway. Okay? That, that, that's a mistake if you go there. What we see here is that these are good people, nice people, observant people. These are people who follow the law. If you're looking at a, a large amount of breaks, you're not going to find that. But does that mean that Zechariah has never had lust in his mind? Sure he has. Does that mean that they have never broke the law? Not on a habitual type of thing, but surely, once again, they are not perfect individuals. So here we have this nice couple, an unassuming couple, a couple not with big giant stars or celebrity. They don't have a YouTube page, I promise you that. And here they have it, but they do have a significant problem. We come to verse 7. And we come to verse 7, and we see here three descriptors. They, in verse 7, but they had no child. Why? Because Elizabeth was barren. Second thing. And third thing, both were advanced in years. If these guys had a publicist, they would need to hire a new publicist. This is not a great... Uh, this is not a great you know, group of things that are said about them, okay? Basically, it says, here's these nice people, all of them, non-blessed, and past their prime, right? That's what it says here. So, uh, again, if you're looking for people to say, hey, good job, but uh, that, that, that's, uh, these are people who are, they're, they're done, they're over with. Uh, that's, that's how you should understand them. So he continues on, he says, here they are, and they have no child, she is barren, and both are advanced in years. Now, again, we need to understand the importance of having children within this context. Within this context, to have a child was very, very important. 
There is no social security program. You have children and you have many children because children die on a regular basis, especially at this particular time. You have many children so that your children can grow, that they can go ahead and they can take care of you because they are your social security program. They are, okay? Because they gotta take care of you in your old age because there's nobody else there, okay? Herod the Great's not gonna take care of you, your kids are, okay? And if you've got no kids, that's pretty tough. We look at the example of Ruth, and Ruth, there she is, she's a widow. You've got Naomi, the kids are dead, this is bad. Everything, nothing's good, okay? And here we have Elizabeth, and she seems to like be a good gal, and Zechariah seems to be a good guy, and yet they have no children. And we have plenty of examples of the Old Testament. Psalm 127 talks about, you know, blessed is the man who has children. He has a quiver full of them, right? That's fantastic. Boom. That's, that, that's what you want to have, but no children. It is a common Old Testament theme with women who do not have children or couples that don't have children, and then God, then God blesses. We look, for example, of Sarah. Sarah, who has her child when she is 90 years old. It's old. You're like, well, they lived longer back then. That's true, but 90 is not the new 25. <laughs> I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Okay? I mean, when we look at Sarah, Sarah is a woman who's very much postmenopausal. She is beyond the time of having children. We have examples of Rachel. Rachel has problems having children. We have the example of Hannah not, uh, not having children and pleading and praying to God and God giving her Samuel, for example. So we see these examples. And I don't doubt for a moment that Elizabeth and Aaron, very much like Hannah, would pray to God and say, please give us a son, give us a son, give us a son. Because not only do we want to have a social security system, but we also want to have one who will continue on the legacy of godliness and to tell people about the great Messiah, which you are going to bring because salvation will come through the Jews, salvation will come through Israel, and we want part of our lineage to be the one who is telling that message. Right? Hallelujah. And they got nothing. I like Zechariah. I like Elizabeth. They're nice people. Advanced in years. No children. Elizabeth is called barren. There's no hope. Hmm. Now, this is all brought up here, but we all understand how stories work, how narratives work. We see that there's a problem, but so we're looking autom almost automatically. There's got to be, there's got to be a solution here. We're looking for that solution to come, and we're going to see it because God is going to speak. The silence is going to be broken right here. Verse 8. Now, while he was serving, that while Zechariah was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside the hour of incense. So let's take a, uh, take a, a thought about what happens here. So Zechariah is a priest. And you're like, okay, Zechariah is a priest. Now, understand this, he is not the high priest. When you have the temple, you have the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies has the Ark of the Covenant in it. The high priest will enter into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement, and he will offer sacrifice there. Okay? That's the Holy of Holies. That's the place only once a year. But then you have an outer court after that. We'll call that the Holy Place. And so we have the priest who can enter in there. And there's other, in there's other pieces of furniture that are there, and one of those is the altar of incense. And so you have other people, not the high priest, but other priests who will come in and they will do different things at the different furniture. And one of, in his particular job, he is drawn by lot to go ahead and to burn incense on the altar of incense. So you have the Holy of Holies, then you have another group outside, and then you have the group of Jewish men outside of there, and they're praying. Matter of fact, they're mentioned here. They're praying outside of that. And then outside of that, you have the women and then outside of that, you have the Gentiles, okay? So that's what you've got going on here. So he's not all the way inside, but he's pretty far in. So that's what his job is. And keep in mind, as he is lighting the incense and he's burning the incense, here, I was lighting a match, sorry. As he's probably had a candle and he's, as he is, is, has the incense and is, it is burning and the, and the smoke is going up, it, is a, it, it gives us the, the image of the prayers of the people just outside. The prayers are heading up, the incense is headed up. That's what you've got going on here. All right, so he's doing that. Keep in mind that there's lots of priests. There's probably about 18,000 priests 
okay, at this particular time. And because there's 18,000 priests, you don't have everybody go in. Matter of fact, you only have one person to go to, go to the altar of incense. Who? And they roll the lots, and the person is chosen. If you are a priest, such as Zechariah, you may never in your entire life as a priest ever have that job. If you have it twice, wow! If you have it once, that's still a wow. Amazing. I have been chosen. And they understand this, this rolling of lots, whatever it is, whatever it looked like, a dice or something. And as they do this, they understand this as depending upon the providence of God and that God is going to allow who he wants to enter into this place. And who does God want? Zechariah. They think it's random. I'm here to tell you that God is not in randomness. And God says, today's the day when Zechariah's number comes up. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. Because the God who was silent is now going to speak. And the God who is going to speak is going to speak to exactly the person he wants to speak to. Pretty good. So the dice, if you will, the dice are rolled. And here he comes. He comes on in. Zech <clears throat> verse, uh, pick it up in verse uh, 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So here you have this man, and he's supposed to be basically by himself going in to light the altar of incense, and somebody else is there. Okay? And Zechariah, like this here, was troubled. Like it's a little bit of an understatement. And then, it, and then it magnifies a little bit. He was troubled, and when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Okay, he's troubled and fearful, right? All right, there it is. <gasps> what, what is going on here? Now, I like to, you know, you and I, we like to think of it this way. We think, oh, an angel. He gets to see an angel. Cool, neat, right? You know? Every time I see in Scripture people who see angels, I mean, it's a freaky thing. That's just all there is to it, right? People are scared. They are. We see John scared in the book of Revelation. We see Daniel scared. We see Isaiah scared. We see, we see right here, Zechariah is going to be scared, okay? Virtually, always, I'm probably not, I don't want to say always because I can find that an exception or two, but usually you see people who are kind of freaked out. And we like to say, well, what did the angel look like? Did he have big giant wings? I don't see anything about wings here. I don't see anything about shininess here, though we see it in other places. What's, what, what did he look like? He is going to introduce himself, I'll, I'll tell you this already, he's going to introduce himself and he's going to say, I am Gabriel. And we find Gabriel all the way back in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 15. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 15, Daniel tells us that he sees Gabriel who looks like a man. So as, as Zechariah comes in, he sees this guy. We don't have any details except for he comes in an appearance of a man or man-like. Does he have wings plus or shininess plus? I don't know the answer to that. All I know is that he comes in there and there's somebody who's not supposed to be there and whoo, and that gets his attention, right? All right. He's troubled, he's fearful. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife will soon bear a son and you shall call his name John. Whoa. Whoa. Don't be fearful. Your prayer has been heard. Now, once again, we ask the question, what was the prayer? And unfortunately, we don't have the content of the prayer. Some people speculate, well, you know, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're praying for a son. I don't doubt that for a second. Some people say, well, they're praying for the deliverance of Israel. And I don't doubt that for a second. Perhaps it's both of those things, that God would provide for Israel, that God would deliver Israel. And how was that done? Through the son, which is going to be born to this couple. Okay. Whatever the case may be, we can't be overly dogmatic upon this, but Gabriel says, here it is, your prayer has been heard. Verse 14, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him 
in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And I look at this and it's like, you know what, Zechariah, that's a pretty good deal. Zechariah is being told that, guess what? Not only are you going to have a son, but this is what's going to happen with your son. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? That would be a cool thing. You go to the hospital to have your child, right? And your child is born. And, you know, you know, a little Mr. Potato Head child is all wrapped up, you know. They, they all kind of look that way, you know. So it gets to the child, right? And then there's like this readout. So the nurse gives, you know, gives the happy parents, you know, the child, there it is. And then they give the readout. Oh, by the way, here's the readout. And here's what we're going to tell you about all the things that your son or your whatever the case may be, son or daughter, you know, here is what your child is, is going to be like. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, that'd be really nice. They used to have these things called cabbage patch children. You know, you used to adopt a cabbage patch. You, oh, you remember that? You used to adopt a cabbage patch child. And they'd have all these characteristics of the, of the fake doll that you had. You know? Well, that'd be great if you had that for your child, you know. But look at the, the beautiful things that are said about, about John. People are going to be joyful about it. They're going to be rejoicing and be thrilled. Why? For he will be great before the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Could you ask for a greater blessing than that? That the child which you have will be considered great before the Lord. You can stop right there. Right? <whistles> Zechariah's got to be, he should be at this particular moment. I get a kid and he's going to be great before the Lord. Right? That's where he should be. I mean, I think so. And then he goes on a little bit more. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. Now we look at that and we say, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. Why, why is that the case? So if, if we know, again, our Old Testament a little bit, and we go back in the Old Testament, you will find that there is a group called the Nazarites. And there was something called the Nazarite vow. Uh, most of us know the Nazarites best because the Nazarites were known for not shaving uh, or for not cutting their hair. You might remember, for example, Sam, uh, Samson was a Nazarite. He had let the hair grow long, and he had all of that power because his hair was long and the Spirit of God was with him. And you'll remember the very sad story about the Spirit of God left him. He doesn't even realize it. Then he gets his hair cut, and, and then he's just a normal guy. Okay? But the true marks of the Nazarite was one that they let their hair grow, but they also did not drink strong drink. They avoided that. And so what we have here is that the angel is telling Zechariah, your son is to grow up and he's going to be dedicated to God. Okay? So he's going to be strong for the Lord, but he's going to be dedicated to God as a Nazarite. That's, that's, that's what you have here. He continues on. He says, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from the womb. Once again, this is surprising to us as well, that the Holy Spirit will reside within John, will empower John, will fill, control John, even from the womb, which is a surprise to us. Listen, in today's world, when a person comes to Jesus Christ, okay, when a person becomes a Christian, when one accepts Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, okay, and says, I, I, I will follow Christ, they become a Christian. The Holy Spirit comes within that person. The person is baptized into the body of Christ or becomes part of the church because the Spirit dwells within that person at that particular point. And that Holy Spirit fills or controls that person more and more, okay? So you're baptized, you're placed into the body of Christ, placed into the church, and then you are to be filled or to controlled by this Spirit throughout your life. And that, that fluctuates a little bit as we allow the Spirit to control us, but we're supposed to, you know, uh, don't be filled with wine, but be filled by the Spirit according to Ephesians, right? So that's what we have here. But with John, it's a little bit different. This is pre-church, and what we have here is we have the Holy Spirit indwelling, if you will, John, or controlling John, even from the womb. Uh, this is something quite extraordinary. In verse 16, And he, that is John, he will turn many children of Israel to the Lord their God. Which, again, this speaks to us because there is the necessity of the people needing to turn to God, which means that they're going the wrong direction right now. And he will go before him, meaning the Messiah, in the spirit of Elijah. To, why? To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. John's going to go out there and John is going to, to turn the people 
so that they will follow the promised one, the Messiah. Your son's not the Messiah, Zechariah, but this is the forerunner, the one who is coming in the, in the spirit of Elijah. He's coming out there, and he's going to do this great work and lead the way. Notice here it says, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And I remember reading that this week, and I thought, oh, I misread that, because children need to go ahead and follow the wisdom of the fathers. That's how it's supposed to work, right? Kids, obey your parents, right? That's how it's supposed to work. But notice here that it's kind of turned on its head. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Wait a second. The parents are supposed to follow the children. How does, how, how does that work? I'm, I'm questioning that in my mind. And it seems like, look at the next little bit too, because it seems to be a parallel to describe what that means. And the disobedient, meaning the fathers, to the wisdom of the just, meaning the children. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it seems like things have been turned upon their heads. How, do, how does that work? And I, I wanted to argue with the text a little bit on this one here. But Jesus does that. He turns things on its head because understand that these people think that they have it spiritually all figured out and saying, everybody follow me. And Jesus is going to say, religious leadership, all of you guys with powers, I'm going to flip that on its head. I'm going to put new wine in new wineskins. I'm doing something different. If you go to... Uh, Turn to Mark. I like to stay in Luke most of the time, but I want to go to Mark because I think Mark is helpful for us here. In Mark chapter 10, in verses 14 and 15, a passage which you probably know, though you might not recognize it, but you'll recognize it when we get there. But in Mark chapter 10, uh, pick it up in verse 13. And they were bringing children to him. So they're bring, the people are bringing uh, their children to Jesus, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. Verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant with them. And he says this, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for, such, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And what we have here is that John is going to go forth and he is going to, to, he's going to break things up. The wisdom of the fathers is going to be broken up because they have been off course for a while and they need to be brought into repentance. Um, James Edwards, he writes in that commentary on the section of Mark, I thought this was very good. He says, in the story, children are not blessed for their virtues, but for what they lack. They come only as they are, small and powerless and without sophistication, as the overlooked and dispossessed of society. To receive the kingdom of God as a child is to receive it as one who has no credits, no clouts, no claims. A little child has absolutely nothing to bring. Whatever a child receives, he or she receives by grace on the basis of sheer neediness rather than any merit inherit in himself or herself. Little children are a paradigm, are a paradigm of disciples for only empty hands can be filled. John is coming to break things up. Listen, when I was a kid growing up in Spokane, Every winter, we'd have a nice big snow. And the big snow would come, and it would squish down the dirt of the garden. And I remember every spring, my oldest brother, Jeff, he had uh, a job that I only remember him doing. And my parents would say, Jeff, get out there, and rototill the garden. And my brother hated it. Hated it with a passion. I always mowed. Mowing, by the way, is... A lovely job, you know? You take that which is ugly and you make it beautiful. It's like vacuuming outside. I just enjoy it. But rototilling has a different function. Rototilling, you start the rototiller out there and you get the tines going. And you get this dirt which has been packed in by all the winter snow and all the rain and all the leaves and whatnot and all the extra gunk. And the tines begin to begin do their work. And what do they do? They begin to dig within the soil. And begin to chew it up and chew it up and chew it up and chew it up and chew it up. And that which is flat and kind of useless is broken up. And it's broken up by the rototiller after, you know, about an hour or two of rototilling. And so now all of a sudden you have this nice loose dirt. 
And now the rest of the family can go in and they can go with, with, with hoes. And what they can do is they can make a nice little, uh, uh, what are they called, burrows? No. Furrows, furrows. They come, burrows, burrows, they go underground. Furrows, they make these nice little furrows and they can plant all of their seeds or whatever it is. They couldn't do that beforehand. They just throw the seed on top and it doesn't do anything. But now that the soil is broken up, you can plant the seed. And when John comes in, he comes in because he is the rototiller of God. He comes in and his tines begin to break into the soil and break into the soil and break into the soil because he is calling them what for? A repentance. The, re the hardened heart must be broken up so that the seed might be planted. So here comes John the Baptist, rototiller man, and he begins, crunch, 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 crunch. That's his job. Break it up. Break it up so that the good seed might be planted. See? Zechariah, that's your son, my rototiller, and he's coming. So at this particular point, Zechariah should say, thanks for the blessing, put it into his pocket, walk out and say, Yahoo, poor Zechariah. Oh, back in Luke, sorry. So come back to Luke. Zechariah, your son's going to prepare, prepare the way. Why? To prepare a people for, for the Lord. Verse 18, Zechariah now responds. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? God, oh, Zechariah. And what does he say? He looks at all of the hindrances. He says, for I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Oh, man. Okay, first of all, marital advice. <laughs> that last little bit, you never get to say that. My wife is advanced in years. You are in such trouble right there. I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years. Oh, Zechariah. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. And it's, it's kind of a silly argument because, remember, I mean, Zechariah, he's a scholar of the Old Testament. He, he knows the story of, of, of Hannah, and he, he knows the story of Rachel, and he knows the story of Sarah. He, he knows all of these things. He knows the call of Moses where Moses says, well, I can't speak because my, I, 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 I stutter all the time. And God says, who, who made your mouth? He knows these things, but he's in the moment. And in the moment, he says, I'm an old man, I've got an old wife, and how in the world is this going to happen? I like, I, like, I, like, I like Gabriel. I look forward to meeting Gabriel in heaven. Because I like, I like his line here. The angel answered him and he says, I'm Gabriel. Uh, my, my guess is his foot is tapping. I'm Gabriel. I'm Gabriel. Guess what my job is? I stand in the presence of God. <laughs> I, mean, that's, that's so, I mean, that's incredible. I stand in the presence of God. Oh, and by the way, I was sent to speak to you and to bring you good news. I, my name's Gabriel, the Gabriel of the Old Testament, the one who spoke to Daniel. And you know my name, right? Because you're a scholar, you already know this. Oh, by the way, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to give good news to you. And you're going to give me lip. <laughs> Do you think that I go ahead and I go from heaven to come to you to go ahead and go, to waste my time? Okay. He says, okay, here's the deal, dude. Verse 20, and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. 400 years of silence. 400 years of silence. Nothing. And God sends his angel, Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God to give good news and the person who hears it, yeah, but is that right? <laughs> and God says, well, I guess we need a little more silence. And we get more silence. At least nine months. You're not going to get to talk, dude. Because you did not believe my word. Verse 21. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. Now the people are the ones who've been praying outside. Remember the incense is burning and the smoke is going up and the people are outside and they're praying and their, their prayers are going up. 
And they're waiting because people go in and they light and they come back out. So there's a certain amount of time you're supposed to do this. But Zechariah is not coming out as fast as they would expect. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay at the temple. What's going on? Verse 22. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went home. Now, so he comes out there, he can't speak a word. This was interesting to me as well. I was reading in one of a uh, commentary by Daryl Bach, and Daryl Bach says this. He says, not only did he, could he not speak, almost surely he couldn't hear as well. And I said, where does, I don't see that here, but Let's, let's do me a favor. We're going to peek ahead. Look at verse 62 of the same chapter. And in verse 62, there is the naming ceremony of John, right? So when we have the naming ceremony of John, they, they, they bring him out. Uh, let's see here, verse uh, 60, 62. Let me pick it up in verse 60. His mother answered, no, he shall be called John, verse 61. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. Okay. Look at verse 62. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. Now, if, if, if Zechariah could hear, they could just go up to Zechariah and say, do you really want him to be named John? And he would have responded, right? That's, that, that's what would have, would have happened. Okay. But it seems that he does not hear either, so they're making motions or some sort of uh, charades, if you will, biblical charades, so he can understand that the wife wants to call him John. Oh, okay. And so then he calls for something, they write it down, and he says his name is John, we get that. But it appears that it's not only does he not speak, but he also can't understand. Okay, he doesn't hear or he doesn't understand, okay? So we see that. So here we have this man, and, and he is, um, they don't know what's going on, Okay. Surely he's communicated through writing or something like that to Elizabeth and those type of things. We don't have that, but surely, I, I mean, I wouldn't keep that from my wife. I can't keep anything from my wife. I don't think he could keep anything from his wife. If I ever see a, an angel, I'll let you know. Thanks, okay. All right. So we get 400 years of silence. Now we get another nine months of silence, if you will. Pick it up in verse 24 because we see the very first part of the silence, if you will. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. Now, what we have here is we have the supernatural activity of God, a super intervention of God, which allows the conception to take place, but through natural means, okay? So conventional natural means are used to produce the child, although God must have allowed this to have happened, okay? Why do I bring this up? This is important because we are going to see a supernatural conception outside of natural means a little bit later on, okay? Okay, so that's important. You need to understand that because that's a contrast that's in, that, that is here. After these days, Elizabeth conceived, and, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. And again, you get lots of people, and they're saying, Wow, man, why in the world is she hidden? Why is she staying away? I think, number one, she's incredulous. She hasn't had a child. She has not had a child. Now all of a sudden, she's expecting? Really? Really? I, after all of this time, now I'm going to have a child? I know many women, even in today's world, they will not go ahead and to announce a pregnancy too early on because they're like, well, I'm going to make sure that the pregnancy lasts. Right? And perhaps she is being... Over being conservative in this, is, is this, is this going to last? I don't, I don't want to miscarry. I, ho I, hope, I hope this works out. After five months, you can't hide it very well anymore. I know a couple of you women who can, and you're amazing. But, but most women can't after five months, and then all of a sudden, you, they, there's, there's no space left to hide. Elizabeth conceived, and for five months, she kept herself hidden. I, 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 I can't believe this. And she says, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me. God looked at me. He remembered me to take away my reproach among the people. I was nothing in the eyes of people because I didn't receive the blessing that virtually everybody else received, but I didn't get that blessing. And now God says, you relatively ordinary woman, 
I give you that blessing. You will no longer have the reproach. You no longer have people say, oh, poor Elizabeth anymore. Now you are the one who will have that child. And not only will you have that child, you'll have the one with a whole laundry list of great things that you'll be used of God, that your son will, be, will speak for God, that your, that your son will be God's rotodiller. That's pretty awesome. In today's world, we do not look for the, the predecessor to the Messiah. We don't look for the first coming of the Messiah. We look for the second. We look for Jesus to return, do we not? Good. Good answer. And I'm oftentimes, I, see that, I hear this more and more in, in our society. I see almost these exact words in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, or verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand uh, years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We have people out there, ladies and gentlemen, who are out there who are scoffers, who are saying, yeah, where's your Jesus? Where is he at? Is he going to come back? And the answer to that is yes. Our Savior, we don't wait for the first coming, we wait for the second coming, and we know that our Savior will come. As surely as he came the first time, he will come the second time. It took 400 years of silence before he came the first time. Do not be surprised if it takes a long time until he comes the second. It's okay. The reality is this, is that he will come. Jesus will come. And sometimes you look at society, you look at things which aren't going very right, and you say, oh boy, things are, are, are pretty bad. Jesus will come. It's okay. It's okay. And guess what? God is very happy in the meantime to use people who are pretty ordinary, just like you and me, to do incredible type of things. I like that. I'm happy for that. We're not all John the Baptist, I get that. But God will use ordinary people. He used John the Baptist's parents. He did. Again, people will ask, where is he? All I can tell them is, I don't know the answer, and I don't know the timing, but I know he comes. He comes. And don't be fooled by people who say, well, I, it, it's not going to happen. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Our God is a surprising God. And our God as a surprising God will surprise us. And he will use you in a way which you don't necessarily expect all the time. Don't give up on him. He's got things for you to do. He does. He's got things for you to do and they'll come about in his timing. God controls the lots which are thrown. God controls the calendar. God controls the timelines. God controls who will speak for him. God controls you. And in God's time, he will use you as he will. Be available. Be ready. Be ready. Sometimes it may be of great blessing. Sometimes God will use you as a rototiller. But God will use you. Allow yourself to be used by him. Amen? Amen. We start the book of Luke. Book of Luke. God's silence has been broken. Our God is not a deist. Our God is not the, the God of deism, which says God started things and left it all alone. Rather, we have a God who intercedes within humanity, who starts everything and will intercede because we need that intercessor. We need our God to come into history and ultimately to give us the Savior, which will bring us to him. Amen? Amen. Amen.